Hey guys, what is going on? My name is Kiryoku Wrights, here with my co-host, Mummify Tony, and you are listening to the Maybe Pile Podcast. Tony, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing quite alright. I'm, uh, you know, good to go. I honestly haven't thought of uh, one of the fun little things I say at the beginning, so let's just roll with it. Awesome, awesome. I think that was the smoothest intro I've done so far, and it's feeling pretty good. It's probably not going to need any editing from my end. Nice. That's always good. Except for the dehumidifier in the background that turned on literally the second I said, hey, but... <laughs> I ti- wasn't ti- going to say anything. Timing is everything. Uh, you know what the best, uh, what the number one rule of comedy is? Timing. You know it. All right. <laughs> Too bad Hitler never got that joke. Oh, well. Or never got that reference. Oh, well. I screwed it up even further. That's okay. Yeah. It's all right. Moving. We, we are, we're all uh, <laughs> batting nine out of ten uh, over here. Oh, well. All right. So, uh, what have you been up to, man? You said you saw a few movies before we hit the record button? Okay. Yes, I did see uh, some movies while uh, while we were gone. In fact, I saw a movie before we recorded episode six, but then I realized I never actually talked about in episode five. So I was like, I didn't actually get an opportunity to talk about 1917. Ooh, yeah, I've been hearing about that. Tell me. Yes. So, uh... It's it, it stars Gerard Way as the main character. Uh, I'm kidding. That's a joke I've been saying for like the last month is the fact that the main character looks like Gerard Way from um, the, I believe it was the Ghost of You music video he did for My Chemical Romance. And okay. everyone was like, I don't get this joke, Anthony. Why, why do you keep saying Why do you keep saying it? And I'm like, because he does. And then I like pulled up pictures of Gerard Way from uh, Ghost of You. And... I'm, and they're like, okay, yeah, he kind of does actually look like that. So I'm like, ha vindication. But so, um, yeah, it was, it's really, really, really good. Like, I guess that's say the line, Anthony. Uh, it, oh, this movie was really, really good. But no, it actually, I enjoyed it a lot because it's one of those um, slow burn movies. It's not just action, 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 action all the way through. It actually does have um, this great through line that is... Um, accentuated by the fact that it's a quote-unquote one-shot movie and the fact that oh, okay. like it it's filmed in a way to feel like it's just one uh, one take but there are obvious moments where it's like okay here's a cut here's a cut here's a cut yeah i totally get that so it was, it was very interesting how they were able to uh uh, pull those sort of hidden cuts off with like things going in front of it. Now that I'm sitting here talking about it, I'm actually concerned that I've actually talked about this before. Uh, I don't believe you have. No, have, I don't think it, this isn't like me repeating it to you. I mean, obviously you'd be the, uh, no. you're the one I'm talking to about it. And no, I, I, I do not remember you talking about 1917. No, I, you might've said now, usually we talk about, from what I remember, uh, when we record these, we usually talk about movies towards the end of the of the episode and not the, not the very beginning. So you might have mentioned it before we ran out of time, but I don't. I you did not go in depth. No, I would be very surprised if I was wrong about that because everybody knows that I Kiroku am never wrong. Yeah, because it's like I'm sitting here telling you all this, Sarcasm. and I'm like, it's like I I'm getting that feeling like. I'm talking to one of my buddies at work about a movie I went and saw, but then it's like, it, it it's like, no, Anthony, you told me about this yesterday. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, you know, I've been telling everybody I know. So now it's like, I, I have the feeling like a weird deja vu. Like I've already told you about this. Oh, I know. But it's, it's like, oh wait, no. Yeah. I did talk to you yesterday about this. Oh, sorry, bud. And then like move on. But anyway, so if I, if you, if this is the first time you've heard about it, then great. That, yeah. that's, that's definitely, uh, uh, Val, Val validifies the fact that I haven't told you about it. So, um, it is a story of these two guys, um, these two British soldiers from uh, the beginning of uh, the trench warfare that was going on and the fighting uh, the French in World War One. Uh, right. Yeah, it would be uh, World War One because it's nineteen seventeen, right? Yes, World War One started on 1914. I don't know what year it ended, but that was when yeah. it started. And then D-Day was 6th of June, 1940. Not 44. 6th of June, 1944. Yeah. So, yeah, it is. I love that song. I know. That's what, <laughs> It got me through a <laughs> high school test. 
Um, but anyway, so yeah, it, it's during it's following sort of these two guys that are on the British uh, front line for you know um, you know I, uh, fighting in the mud and whatnot, um, and they're given instructions that they they have to go deliver this message to um, the main character's brother who is in this other deployment who's pushing forward uh, to sort of chase the enemy back and um, chase the French, I believe back. And it's like, no, they, they're, they're, they're fleeing. They're, they're running away. So we have to follow them and make sure that, you know, it's a decisive victory when really it's like, no, you're not, they're not falling back because you're winning. They're falling back to lure you into a trap. So in, in order to like prevent massive casualties, they have to go and uh, deliver this message to call off the attack before it's too late. And they have roughly until um, like the following day at like noon or something like that, uh, some sometime around there or dawn or something. I don't know. Um, and they're like, so you have to go run over there and do that. Well, the best way to do this is to then go over the trenches and go straight through and it's like no 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 you should be fine they've they've pulled out of there so that there's nothing to do well there's nothing stopping you and the one main character is like we're going now because this is my brother we're talking about and the other guy's like no let's wait till night and then they eventually do get all they eventually are like no no we have to go now and they're like, he's like okay i guess we gotta go now so they eventually make it over and so forth so forth and they sort of start this great journey not like a great journey but this um long walk to get to their brother and call off the um the attack and it's i will say it's a little bit typical of a sort of war movie it's a lot of like yeah shit really sucks right now and um everything's just really sad you remember did you see wonder woman yeah i have i love that movie yeah and how it did a really great job of showing that like it fucking sucks right now. Like, there is a lot of sadness in the world, and it's just like, yeah. it's just, everybody is just brutally, like, hurt by this. It's not as bad as that, but it's still like, yes, this is a very bad time that we're in right now, and there's a lot of uh, hatred and anger in the world, and we're just, you know, along for the ride, and we're just the people in this war. And it, yeah. it's it's really great how this whole movie lines up and at the end of it, it's sort of, I'm pretty sure from what it explained at the end in the credits is that the character that they're following is actually this producer's grandfather who fought in the war. And these are the stories that he told him. And it's sort of in memory of, of, uh, that's really cool. Of Schofield or of, uh, Schofield, 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 yeah, anyway, he could, uh, yeah, Schofield, and his nickname is Scones. So it's, it's like, yeah, <laughs> this is kind of that. funny. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really fun, like, little thing that, like, yeah, two buddies stuck in the war together would have these nicknames for each other. And yeah. it, it's weird how, um, there are things that just happen randomly within it, and you sit there and you think about these things, it's like, there's no way that this would happen in this way. But he, the director talks about how he would hear these stories from his grandfather. And it's like, no, these aren't just like random happenstance. They're, these weren't just things to like um, punch up the movie. No, random weird things like this just happen. It's just, they just happened in the war. Like, yeah, you might think that's very weird that this one thing actually hit exactly this spot to then create this event. But it's like. No, these things just happen. They, you know, this person goes to here and just so happens to run into this person. That's war, man. It just happens like that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really funny how uh, how you you watch like documentaries and stuff like that. This is a little off topic, but a little not. Like, no, no, go ahead. You, you watch these documentaries on war, and I'll, or you know, like I'll I'll watch a lot of historians on YouTube and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And because uh, I'm a history buff, believe it or not, I absolutely love learning about uh, World War One, Two, the Civil, the American Civil War. You name it, I love it. Mm-hmm. I love learning about it. And uh, nine out of t- nine out of ten times, they will uh, they'll focus on the bigger picture, which they have to. They have to get the as much information out there as possible. But they'll just simplify stuff uh, by saying this army moved from here to here. 
this army took this town, this battle was fought here, and then they moved on to the next one. They make it very general, because they have to. But when you watch a movie like 1917 or Wonder Woman in that, it, you know, in the World War One part of it, it, it shows you the true brutality of it. It's like it's not it's like moving an army from point A to point B is not as simple as, you know, showing the little uh, bar on the map scroll across the screen. It's not that simple. You have uh, like, say, 10,000 individual men that you have to march through this rough terrain, and you have to deal with the civilian casualties, you have to deal with the enemy fire and everything else, the environment and everything, you have to deal with all of that. That's well, to, So that's crazy. To that point, even, it's we uh, sort of, well, me as a civilian who has never actually served, the perspective of a rank is grossly, grossly, like, um, trivialized in my perception of uh, leadership and ranks in uh, military service. It's like, oh, great, you went up a rank. Oh, you got a promotion. In this movie, it does a really great job of talking about, no, the commander talks to this person, the general talks to this person, and they are under the uh, leadership of this person. This person is in charge of these people who then delegate to these people who delegate to these people who talk to the privates. You know, it's it's a chain of command. It, it there is a chain of command and a, um, not bureaucracy, uh, delegation that happens below them. Like he he has to, they have to get to um, this general or whatever, um, who's in charge of this front. Well, they're talking. Uh, he's like, Captain, you have to call this off. F fuck you! I'm not going to call this off. If you want, if you have some uh, something to say, you go talk to the general. And it's like, okay, well, no, you have to do this because you can't just tell a captain to stop. He's following orders from his general or however it works. And you have to right. follow this chain of command because that's how these things work. You know, it, it, it's sort of. It's efficient, but also the exact opposite of efficient at the same time. Exactly. And I just feel that in our modern day ideas of uh, rank and command, it's sort of ruined by you know not to say that there's anything wrong with video games but it's like oh it's just one more rank it's just one more promotion it's the next level that you exist on no this is you in charge of people now it, it's sort of lost in that whole thing and i really i really kind of appreciate it be like oh yeah he talked to the guy in charge so he's got it right no you gotta go talk to that guy's boss and, it, and it's very interesting yeah uh I've never served a day in my life, and I don't intend to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I did take JROTC in in high school, which I will never, comp I will not compare to the actual military. That that would be bigotry or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I the my two instructors were army veterans. One was a lieutenant colonel. One was a command sergeant major. Mm -hmm. And uh, they both served. They were both overseas. They were. And they were phenomenal. I absolutely love those two guys. They, they're they great. We're still in contact to this day, five years after I graduated, whatever. Mm -hmm. They're both great. And uh, they did a phenomenal job at teaching me as a student how the chain of command works. And it, it's, it's pretty much what... Well, actually, it's really just what I told you, or what you explained and what I told you about how it's efficient... And at the same time, it's the opposite, mm -hmm. and uh, you know stuff like that. And it's well, it's like if okay, let's just use this as the example. When I was in my senior year of high school, I was the S two, which was the security officer. So I, so okay. naturally, it being a high school, I didn't do anything. But we <laughs> did, ha but we did have people that were in charge of other things, such as event planning. And uh, stuff like that. You know, they actually had to do fundraisers and other things. Mm -hmm. Our chain of command was uh, thankfully very, very involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, and so with what little experience I have, uh, my sergeant major was very good at you know combining that into a teaching, like a little lesson, saying that you have a lot more to worry about than some individual coming to talk to you. So, and. Uh, Basically, he was I'm trying to figure out how to, how to say this. It's like, oh, if somebody if somebody needed something from me, 
they couldn't talk, they shouldn't have to talk to me directly, they should talk to, like, my assistant, because every, every uh, major officer had an assistant, and, uh, you know, you, you would have to basically go through the chain of command to talk to somebody who is in charge of the bigger picture, because we, as the officers had, except for me, because I was, that was useless, but we, as the officers, were supposed to have more to worry about than the individual. Right, and that's very true of any company, or any actual business company, as opposed to, like, a company of, like, uh, soldiers or whatever. And that's, it's very true that, you know, there's, there are things that a regular customer service representative uh, handles that uh, a manager just does not have time to have to deal with or worry about because, you know, they're busy taking care of other things that the, that the company needs or whatever. So it it's very true. And being able to go through that line of leadership and having it there uh, for you and can be hurtful and not and whatnot. So it's like, okay. And it, it there's events in the movie that like, I can allude to with this, but I don't want to give it all away because you know, there's, it's like, uh, I, it, it's just, it's one of those movies that if you have the chance to go see it in theaters, it's a big war movie. So obviously getting in a theater to experience it is very important. It will not important, but it helps um, establish the... It's more true to how the author means for you to experience it sort of deal. Like, I don't want, like, it's a difference between seeing it in a movie versus on your phone. It's like, if there's a big explosion that happens, you're not going to have, you're not going to be on your phone. And it's like, whatever. If it happens in the theater, it's like very, and in your chest and you feel it. And it's like, oh, oh my God. Okay. Yeah, no, this is, this is more of a visceral reaction to the events that are happening, especially in uh, what I would say in the first act, there's a moment where, um, there's a startle, and it's like, huh, and it's like, oh, okay, it's fine. But then something happens that it's like, oh, fuck, no, we gotta go. Like it's very quick, and it's all of a sudden like, oh, oh, wait, shit, and then just gone. And it's like, uh, and, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah. it's there. You feel it, and it's true, and you're like, oh my god, it's it, it's one of it's almost like Lord of the Rings in the sense that it's like, no, this is gonna be a long journey, and it's gonna be a hard one. Obviously, it's not three films long of a journey, and it's not gonna be three films hard of a journey, but it's still, we have to deal with this. And it's great in showing, um, like I said, like a lot of things that we in our modern era sort of take for granted, um, mostly just from playing video games of the era, you know, playing all of our World War II shooters like Call of Duty and whatnot, like Call of Duty 1, that is, you know, World War II shooters, it's like, okay, you're going to have an emblem floating above their head saying, hey, this is a bad guy. Hey, this is a good guy. Don't shoot this guy. Shoot this guy. He's a German. He's a fr- he's uh, from France. Uh, or he's from France. You know, he's um, Russian. He's American. He is, you know, English, whatever. You know, it's very hard yeah. to sort of make those distinctions when it's real life. It's dark. It's so you can't see the person very well. You can't just shout, "Hey, mate, are you? Do you speak English?" Oh shit, he's French. Oh god, you know you can't, you can't do that all the time in the dark. And yeah, it, it's very, very cool to see. It, obviously, it sucks because it's a war movie and there's fighting and there's death and whatnot. And obviously, it's very sad, but it's a very cool thing to sort of view and experience through yeah, this fictionalized I- media. Yeah, I would I would love to see that in the theaters. I, I usually try to see my movies in theaters if at all possible because the the experience you know is just way better. I know some people say they they abhor, but I guess abhor is the right word. They abhor theaters because it's you know they say it's dirty, people are loud, and sometimes that's true. But if you get like a if you get a theater in like a quiet backwater town like where I watch my movies, it's not busy that often, so you can pretty much watch without distraction. And I don't even think, like, a lot of people, you know, fuck around too much in the theaters that are around me. I mean, obviously, I don't know much about your city, but since I'm in the, like, major metropolitan area of the Phoenix Valley, you know, we get a lot of, we have theaters out the ass uh, here. They're everywhere because there's a shit ton of people. You know, if you want, if it's the night before 
you know, Star Wars comes out and you want a ticket for opening night, well, guess what? You're going to have to go way the fuck out of nowhere because everything within a, like a 30 mile radius is going to be sold out. You know, you're going to have to go out to like halfway out to Apache Junction, which is a town that's way out in the middle of off to the side of the city or, you know, way out to halfway to L.A. You know, it's 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 pretty packed with theaters just because we have a, a dense population. But yeah, I don't I don't run into a lot of like problems with that well everyone seems to be real chill about movies it's like okay you might get the occasional like crinkly bag or you know something like that but it's like well, that right, just well, happens it happens but you know a lot of people at least now since we're able to um since a lot of the theaters are now letting you pick your own seats and uh schedule your own uh whatever appointments and buying online and picking your own seats and things like that it's really gone down. Like there's not a lot of people that are just assholes in the movie. I haven't ever had to been like, Hey, can you fuck off? Well, except for that guy that fell asleep in the final, uh, final, uh, interview in the Joker that I was pissed at. Fell asleep. Yeah. I'm sitting there watching the new, uh, walking Phoenix Joker movie, uh, whenever it came out and the guy three seats over from me starts fucking snoring. Like, he's full-on laid out snoring. And I'm, like, looking at him, like, what the fuck, dude? And, like, he had a his wife, girlfriend, whatever, was with him. And I'm like, seriously? She's like, what do you want me to do? Wake him the fuck up! <laughs> I mean, yeah, kind of. Like, is, nudge his shoulder or something, I don't know. Like, if you don't, I'm going to start throwing popcorn. Because this is rude. I mean, I get the fact that, like, I'm seeing this at a 9.30 showing at night, but at the same time, I'm like, if you can't stay up for the movie, fuck off. Yeah, I really, t- and if they didn't have, like, any kids with them, then that's, I don't know, because I, I, I would picture somebody that that is so fucking tired that they fall asleep in the middle of the movie, or I guess that's toward the end of the film. I could just imagine them being, like, an exhausted parent or something like that. Or maybe they would have, like, a kid with them or something, but that's it just... I don't know, man. That's I can't... No matter how hard I'm trying, I can't justify that in my head. Keep that in mind that I remind myself why I tried so hard. Because you find a... Because you, you quoted whatever. Anyway, the word you what said reminded it? me of Lincoln Park. Oh, okay. I didn't get it. it it's Over my oh, head. I don't know. The people watching at home will get it over my head, man. I don't know. It's okay. I was, I was just trying to justify how he could fall asleep in a theater, and I'm just like, no, I can't I can't justify that in my mind, no matter how hard I think. And it's no. like, uh, and it's like one of those things that I'm like, okay, like, things happen, but it was the climax of the movie. Like, it's Joaquin Phoenix, uh, kind of spoilers, but you've probably seen it by now. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix is on uh, Murray's show. He's sitting there. He's talking to the guy. Things are amping up. Tensions are starting to be uh, build. And then I hear snoring, and it completely rips me out of the movie-going experience, puts me back in my body, and I have to fucking deal with this asshole who's not, who's ruining it for me. And I'm like, really? I hate it. Like, it just, ugh. It just that, that, is, that is really bad. I, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine doing it. That would suck. I would be very embarrassed if I was with them. I, I did get embarrassed in a movie theater one time. It was, mm-hmm. uh, it was Star Wars, what was it? It was The Force Awakens when they came out. And I went with one of my friends, who, he's pretty chill now, he's a great guy. I mean, who he was cracking was, jokes and shit? He was trying to. Yeah. And the humor was not landing, sort of like my humor. It doesn't <laughs> land. And uh, he was, he kept like, he would like lean over, he would like nudge my shoulder, he would lean over, he'd be like, yeah, those two banged, those two fucked. It's like, even if they are, I really don't give a shit, and I definitely don't have to hear it from you. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't care about your, your fan fiction that you're just coming up in, with your head. You're just coming up within your head just with, you know, at a moment's notice. I don't I don't need to know this. Yeah, I remember you talking about him, and then you went back and saw the movie again, and you're like, oh yeah, I yeah. didn't even get that part. <laughs> yeah, I saw it with my father, like, maybe uh, a couple of weeks, if not just a week later. And uh, it was, like, a completely different experience. <laughs> I didn't know if I talked about that or not. I knew I knew I said something about seeing it with my dad, but I didn't know if I talked about him fucking up the movie a little bit for me. 
I think that was episode three or four that we went over that. Okay. Something back then. I just re- yeah. if, it's like, oh, I remember that story. Yes. Yeah. Fuck that guy. Don't fuck yeah. that guy, but fuck that guy. <laughs> yeah, I was fucking cracking jokes and just saying how all the characters were banging. And it's like, I just don't care. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. So you've heard that story. It doesn't, it's, it's irrelevant. <laughs> but, no, it's uh, fine. Yeah, so it, it's, it's whatever. Uh, yeah, it's just kind of just kind of a thing. I don't know what else to say about it. So, uh, what else have you seen? You said you saw two movies. Yeah. Uh, if you want to jump into the other movie that I saw, um, what was the other movie that I saw? I know that I saw another one. I know I saw uh, the gentleman, and that okay. was that was really good. I was, I really. Uh, so I, I I've been writing reviews for it and I've kind of been just keeping them on my computer and uh, you know kind of getting a feel for it. Um, some of them I'm like you know I I can't I try to get all my thoughts out in an hour, whatever I'm able to write down in an hour. It is what it is, but then you know I don't know uh, the gentleman. I was able to be like okay yes. These these are my opinions. This is what I'm trying to say. Here it is. And I was able to get it all out exactly how I wanted to do in about an hour. Obviously, I haven't gone back to um, re, uh, refine revise it. or refine or, you know, at all spell check what I'm what I actually wrote. But oh, I really feel like anybody else is going to read it at this point. No, <laughs> but I. Oh, sorry. Hold on. <clears throat> all right i'm good to go Yay. <laughs> all right now i'm good to go okay so like what i was about to say here is that you know i was able to like put all my thoughts onto this uh review quote unquote of the gentleman and it's great because it's um i want to say it's like the first actual real guy Ritchie film that i've ever seen uh guy Ritchie being the director of this and for people who don't uh know who that is or aren't like director savvy um guy Ritchie is pretty much made a name for himself uh writing fast talking british um not not gangster but sort of crime-esque movies uh movies about people like trying to make a heist trying to do a thing trying to you know get set up you know or get a get something set up so that they can, you know, make a quick buck or whatever through, uh, nefarious means, so to speak. And, um, it's just, he, he's one of those directors that are like, um, use like the British slang and, you know, that sort of quintessential cockney. And it's like, Oh, I mate, you coming, uh, you coming around giving a, uh, taking the piss off. Yeah. Hey mate, you know, doing that whole, like, things that are very foreign and not typical with American slang and whatnot. It's like, uh, uh, what's up going on with this punk? Uh, that, that guy is a real fucking knob or something like that, you know, but right. Guy Ritchie, obviously being a British, um, uh, director uses a lot of, uh, talent from the UK that, uh, understand what it means to be these characters. And, uh, what um like to get that british feel and to be able to present uh, a movie that feels very very british you know what i mean oh Um, yes and it's weird that like how his signature style is very similar to uh edgar edgar wright's style if you ever saw scott pilgrim or any of the uh Coronetto trilogy with like Hot Fuzz, uh, Shaun of the Dead at World's End. Oh god, I haven't seen any of those. Oh my god, K, you have a homework to do, my dude. Uh, but no, they're they're great movies, and they have a lot of like quick jump cuts. That um, what was it? It was Edgar. No, it's um, go if people at home and K. Uh, go look up the video by the YouTube channel, Every Frame a Painting, and go, that's the channel name, and I believe the video title is something along the lines of, 
uh, Edgar Wright something blah blah blah. It, it's the video t- where he talks about Edgar Wright and his use of transitions and changing and whatnot. And it's very, it's a, one of those very smart uh, video critique um, channels. And I just absolutely love what they do, uh, along with things like uh, that Folding Ideas does. And um, there's a couple of videos that Rocket Jump Film School also talks about when like about cuts and changes and whatnot. But anyway, blah, 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 whatever. Um, the movie itself, it, it's like, okay, great. It's it's the first real Guy Ritchie film I've seen because he also did um, he also did the Sherlock Holmes movies and then he also did... Oh, he also did the uh, Disney Aladdin. He made the new Aladdin movie and I'm just like... Oh, the live oh, action thing? Yeah, and I, I haven't seen... The new Aladdin, I did see the Prince Ali uh, segment that was cut out and shared somewhere on YouTube. And I'm like, okay, but I wasn't really paying attention to like the filming of it. It was more that first time I saw it, I was just kind of taking in how Will Smith performed Prince Ali versus like my what I remembered um, Robin Williams. It was just the main thing that I took away from it is that Will Smith, I was actually able to like... um, uh, he was uh, much more articulated with his words. And I can understand that when he says it's um, all, he has all these creatures, it's a world-class menagerie Prince Ali. Fabulous. He, and I'm like, Oh, that's what he said. That's the, pretty much the only thing I took away from that, but okay. back on topic again. I'm sorry. Uh, the movie, the gentleman, uh, like I said, it's made by this guy who very much understands British crime street thug kind of uh, uh film and whatnot so but it's not a cliche either with his filming it's very it's very crisp and new and very uh um uh, un, unseen before or it, it first time being seen whatever i don't know I'm, sounds like just a, a sounds like a very good director in his natural element exactly and i guess damn it k yes that is exactly what i'm trying to say <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, let me talk about the actual movie. So the movie is a frame story in the sense that, you know how, did you ever see The Princess Bride? No. Oh my God, Kay. All right, add it to your list. <laughs> it's uh, growing so long. It's growing. Okay, so Princess Bride is a movie where um, the kid from The Sandlot is sick. It's not literally the same kid. It's the actor who played the kid. Right. And his grandfather comes over to um, read him a story, which is The Princess Diaries. So it's like, okay, um, I'm going to read this story to you when uh, because you're sick, because I read it to your father when he was sick. And it's like, okay. And then 90% of the movie takes place within this fantasy world that the grandfather is reading him. And so the movie is a frame story. No, Ferris, not now. Now it's podcast time. Cuddle time comes later. Hey, don't you bite me. Feline alert. Bastard. Anyway, uh, so um, he, it, it's a frame story. So it's um, Hugh Grant, the guy from like, what is it? Like failure, not failure to launch. Um, two weeks notice with Sandra Bullock. Well, the failure holiday. To launch, that's a movie I've seen a few times. Okay, not failure to launch. I, I started to go in that direction, then <laughs> I'm like, oh, wait, no, not him. Uh, that, oh, but, but still starring Matthew McConaughey. Okay. Matthew McConaughey was in Failure to Launch, the guy yeah. that, you know, the guy that's like, hey, I, I just love living with my parents. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's like, no, you actually need to get out and do whatever. <laughs> really? And so he does. That that Failure to Launch, you know, you saw the movie. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was just agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. So it's got Matthew McConaughey, but anyway, it's got uh, Hugh Grant in it. Uh, n- thank God, not playing the Hugh Grant character that he plays in every single movie he is he's in, uh, like Notting Hill, uh, The Holiday, um, Two Weeks Notice. You know, not the. Well, I'm just trying to be the most polite and posh uh, British person in this American-made film. You know, I just I I'm just so bothered by the fact that I'm just so posh. You know, just <laughs> oh, I can't believe this whole thing is happening. It's like. God damn it, Hugh. Go get a fucking different role for once. Jesus. And instead, he's playing a very, you know, oh, it was, uh, Michael, kind of, sort, of, sort of a smug, grimy, Michael Kine kind of character. And I'm like, ooh, ooh, good. Let's go with this. This is fun. I like seeing this actor in this different role. 
So he comes to uh, Charlie, what's his name's house? Uh, the guy from Sons of Anarchy, uh, who was also in King Arthur, which was another Guy Ritchie movie, but I never saw it, and apparently it bombed hard. Um, goes to his house and starts cra- uh, telling him this story of like pretty much what he's been up to the last week or so. Uh, or the last month or whatever uh, the time frame it is, where he's telling him the story of what's going on with Charlie, a.k.a. Ray's um, boss, Matthew McConaughey, and his dealings in this underground uh, weed-selling business in the UK. Uh, Matthew McConaughey's character is like this very well-established uh, kingpin who is at the top of... Um, pretty much the ta- the number one seller of weed in in the entire, you know, UK. So he's got all this money and luxury and whatnot, but the thing is, he wants out. He's done. He wants to sell off his entire business to the next big upstart or whatever. And early on in the first act, he's sitting there talking about the fact that it's like, well, why are you selling this off? I don't... It seems like you've got everything already established and whatnot, um, why are you selling this off to me? Well, he explains that it's not, it's, it's well established now as an underground thing. But when in the next coming years, when the UK, uh, the British government starts enacting laws to turn grass legal, he's going to need to have the company itself is going to need somebody who has a much shinier, brighter face on them and not so. In, in his own words, I've got I've got too much blood on my hands per se, literally and figuratively, to right. bring this company into the into the into the daylight. So he has this whole thing about it. it's like okay, you're gonna if I'm gonna sell you the company for, I believe it was four billion dollars that he's selling this company for, Ooh. and the scale and whatnot that they're actually showing off. It's like yeah this guy like they're paying not just it's like oh yeah he's got a lot of money and he you know we're just throwing numbers around no the scale that they're showing that this guy is working in actually is able to be backed up in the story it's like no they're kind of showing us no this is a big deal he is actually able to probably move this much product and you know sell this much and do this much and blah 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 but it's just one of these things that it's like it's it's kind of funny because um uh, it's like, yeah, he's going to sell his company for $4 billion to this other guy that, you know, it's like, oh, by the way, when it does go legal, you have enough, um, you have enough of an infrastructure already built up that this whole entire company will grow, will grow a hundred times by then. Um, so it's like, okay, well, great. He does it. And in the next, the rest of the month movie kind of follows along, um, the next couple of weeks as, you know, money is moved in escrow and blah, 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 yada, yada. And shit starts hitting the fan. And this is sort of like where things start going awry with the whole uh, plan. And uh, Matthew McConaughey kind of has to go through the process of um, writing the wrong that happens uh, towards like the middle of the first act and how they're also investigating what caused these events while also still existing in this frame story that this whole time Matthew or um, Hugh Grant is telling uh, Charlie Wortham or something Charlie whatever the the guy with the beard the main character from Sons of Anarchy um, who I realized is also from uh, London as well I'm like well shit there's another guy also British thought, actors I, around yeah I was like I thought like three or four of these British guys in the movie was were um, really Americans putting on a really good accent. No, fuck me, right? All these people are actually from Britain or Scotland or Ireland, you know, anywhere on the islands, and they're, they were putting on an American accent and all this other shit that I thought I knew. And I'm like, well, fuck. It's like when you find out that... Um, what's his name? House. Um, Hugh Laurie is actually from Britain, and you see him... You hear him talking his regular accent. It's like, oh, well, wow. Hmm, okay. I had no idea that he was. Yeah, it's weird. He just all of a sudden goes from his house voice and ma 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 to his actually like, yeah, I'm actually British. And I'm like, oh, Dang. that's cool. Yeah. But so like, it, and it's all about how um, Hugh Grant is trying to uh, bribe for like 200,000 uh, 
uh, British pound sterling, and he's like, okay, I, I'm actually supposed to be selling this uh, story to my tabloid boss, but I won't because I'm a nice guy and I want to bring this information to you of all this stuff that I've gathered on you guys for, you know, this amount of money, essentially blackmailing him, but being very uh, coy about it. So it it's a very, uh, again, say the line, Anthony, it's a really, really good movie. <laughs> and I, I would really recommend that if you have a moment, the UK especially, but also you, the listener, uh, have a moment, take the second to uh, win it. If you can go see it in theaters, go see it because you can enjoy it right now. But if it's no longer in theaters where you live and you have to resort to streaming options or picking it up on Blu-ray or whatever, sure, whatever, go for it. It's a really good movie and you should like commit an evening to just sitting down and watching it. That sounds really fun. Sounds like a really good story and a really good film all around. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I had fun with it. I, I, I wanted to go see it with my boys, but they're all like, eh, I don't really feel like seeing it. And I'm like, well, too bad. I'm going to go see it anyway. Guess we're flying solo. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's pretty cool stuff. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. I wish I had something to add to that, but usually I'm not a, I'm not a film guy, so I don't really see that much, even though I should. I always say this. But uh, I just don't have much to add for when we talk about movies. <laughs> eh, so I that's alright. I've been trying to watch a few more, but it's... I don't know. Have you been watching anything lately? Ugh, nothing new, sadly. What 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 do you have to bring to show and tell to tell the class this week, Kay? Uh, other than overworking myself to the point of illness. Well, that's no fun. No, it is not. At least mm-hmm. the store. I'm working on the store more, which is which is really good. Yeah, you. So, I, I. You've talked about painting and how your buddy almost got arrested. Oh yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. Did I, did I talk about that on the podcast? Yes, you did. I don't know if I said that in the recording or just said that to you. Yeah, he, yeah, he almost got arrested because somebody, one of the troopers, thought he was stealing. <laughs> but I already said, I already talked about that. Yeah. Currently, I hope there's no, I hope there's no like picking noises or clicking noises in the recording because I'm trying to, I'm trying to pick blue paint out from under my fingernails and it's no fun. <laughs> well, uh, best to leave it and just let it grow out. And let your body naturally push it away from your body. That's true. I naturally have long, long nails, so I should just let it go. Cut uh, that shit. Oh, I like long nails. I find them to be very useful when I scratch myself everywhere. Yeah, but scratching is bad. That's how you tear up your skin and allow bacteria to fall under the under the surface of the skin, and it's bad, man. Don't do that. Oh, well. If you if you want to be have luscious luscious beautiful skin like me, okay, you have to take care of yourself. <laughs> that is you true. have I to. to I need to do that. Ugh. You have to scrub and delicate and exfoliate nightly to help make sure that your skin rejuvenates in the night. I need a nice long soak in a hot tub and a glass of white wine. Okay, when you come to Phoenix, you must simply go out with me. We'll hit the town. We'll expunge. It will. We'll exfoliate. We'll have. We'll make a night of it. It'll be marvelous and decadent. Are there any anime cons out there? Yeah, there are, but you know, some of yeah. them are kind of meh. Yeah, we uh, could try painting one time. The production that I that you sort of like paint in my mind kind of tells me that you guys might be a little bit too big for the anime cons that happen that happen here um the best con that i could probably think of that you might fit in for would be more of a um uh phoenix comic con i think w- it might be the best for the scale that you're presenting that's true we could definitely try that we I, I don't know how i, I mean we just bring a lot to the table literally our tables that we bring to the <laughs> are very full <laughs> So and that's that's in a literal sense. We just bring a bunch of a bunch of stuff. So uh, you know how it is. We'll just, we just now we'd like I to cover all around. What's up? Now that I think about it, I think that you know the two cons that like I know know about for anime 
Um, you probably actually wouldn't stick out too much. I mean, okay, so like just running down my sort of circuit that I go through and I just kind of go hang out, check out the vendor hall would be Teo, but really don't go to Teo. I hear bad things about it. Um, more bad things about its management and its ownership. Um, there's Saboten Khan. There is Khan Nichiwa down in Tucson. And then you have Phoenix Comic Con and Tucson Comic Con, which I feel are both big, big time cons that you could like definitely make your way at. But for Sabaton, Sabaton, Konichiwa, and Teo, I think, yeah, I do see people maybe with 30, 40 by 10 booths there that, you know, they have just the giant table of, uh, figures and uh gundam and figmas and plushies and patches and lights and random things so i I don't know i mean like i guess my perception of your big deal isn't too big for them i mean they they have not too big you definitely have uh they have bigger uh production or bigger footprint vendors there that they could definitely uh house you guys never mind Cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, I'd say twenty by twenty by ten is I think was our anime NYC booth size twenty by ten, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. our BronyCon booth size. My God, it was so small. It was like yeah. 10, I think it was ten by ten, maybe even less. I don't know what it was. Mm. It was it was puny, but uh, you know, I guess it, it, the it really depends on you know travel costs and. Uh, Travel cost, lodging cost, and uh, the cost of food, the booth, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the space obviously costs a little bit. Oh, for sure. Like, you obviously don't want to, you know, lose money going to a con. You That's a risk about, you always uh, take. Yeah, you want to obviously make sure that, you know, okay, what are expenses? What what would it take to take all of our products, move it all the way down to Arizona to hit these cons, and then, you know, is it worth it to go do this? And how much product do we have to sell at these things? Okay. What is the number of people that go to the con? Okay. What's the likelihood? What do, what do, what have other vendors done at the con and how, what have their numbers been in comparison? You know? Yeah. There, there's a lot of things that go into considering, you know, where you want to vend. And also a big one is, uh, not only where it's located, but how is it ran? How is the convention ran? How are the vendors treated? You know, the staff, how do they act towards vendors? Because uh, the Baltimore Convention Center is amazing. The staff are great, as long as you don't lose anything. If you lose something, you're never going to find it. If you leave something behind during cleanup, it's gone. It's it's vanished. Yep. There's no such thing as lost and found. It's it's gone. Nah, you're, you're out, mate. Yeah, so if like, I remember when we were cleaning up after BronyCon, uh, these... I think I already said this. These guys left like some grid wall there, and the the cleanup crew offered it to us. They're like, "Hey, if you if you don't want this, that's fine, but it's going in the garbage if you don't take it." So, you know, there's there's no such thing as lost and found there. It's it's gone. But whatever, yeah. it doesn't matter if it's something big like grid wall or something small like they might save a phone if they find it or some keys maybe. Mm-hmm. But if if it's something else, it's it's in the garbage or in some. I'm not gonna say it's in somebody's pocket, but it's it's definitely in the garbage if it's not something like a phone or keys. Anyway, though, but it, it depends on stuff like that. Like how helpful are the staff? You know, are you responsible for everything, or will they help you in some way? It, it all depends on stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, if everything seems to be on the up and up, why not? I can see I can see us doing Phoenix Comic Con. I can definitely see us doing that. The people I work with, I've learned, are very unorthodox in that they they sit back and they look at the big picture, and whenever I try to do that, I get this sense of I don't know if this is going to work. I don't. I don't. This doesn't seem to be fitting in my vision. This doesn't seem to you know fall into place quite right. Maybe we shouldn't do this particular thing or this particular event. And from my perspective. The boss man looks like he jumps in head first without a second thought. 
Mm-hmm. But as we go along, I learn that he has thought this through, that he has thought of X, Y, and Z scenario, not every scenario, but a few, and it seems to always work out. So I, I've learned to trust him when he makes a judgment call. I've learned to trust him. And I've also kind of learned, you know, I should put my input in on X, but not on Y. You know, I've, I'm, I'm, sl- I'm in the process of slowly learning how to, how to work with everybody. And that's definitely something that, like, you might not notice right away, but, you know, I don't know, it's good to know that the people, that the guy that's in charge or the people that are in charge are, you know, taking these in, these things into account and they're actually, you know, sound, sounds like they're making sound decisions and whatnot with their um, uh, choices and whatnot, so. Yeah. That's always cool. I, I, one thing I need to learn is I need to learn critical thinking, but I also need to learn not to second guess myself or to second guess others. I've done that mm-hmm. a lot, and it's cost me a lot. Mm-hmm. It's cost me many, many opportunities uh, second guessing things myself, other people. That's cost me a lot over the over the past two years. So I've I've basically just learned to just go with the flow and just make my own way and just jump in, you know. If somebody seems like they have faith, just just jump in. Use common sense, but just don't be afraid. Obviously, yeah, to a point, you know. I I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, it's like, where in my past have I been in the same situation that you're sort of describing? And I believe just sort of like running down the catalog that exists in my head of like previous moments in my life. It's like, well... I can't really think of a time where it's like, well, they probably are in charge. Or if I noticed something was wrong that I should have spoke up or something to that effect. It's the only time that I could ever think about this was when I noticed my, one of my friends going after a girl that I knew was problematic and I should have told him about it. But at the same time, I'm like, yeah, he's probably fine. He's he's got a level head on his shoulders. And then it's like, oh, wait, no, things did go bad. And I'm like, well, shit, I guess I should have told him. Uh, oh, that's so bad. I don't know how I would have I should have better handled it. I mean, like, at what point does that do I go from looking out for my bro versus cock blocking? You know, that's such a difficult balance to keep. It's easy. It's easy for me and you to sit here and say, be smart, use common sense, and, you know, don't second guess. Have faith in your friends and yourself and all of that stuff, which is all true. But it's really hard to actually maintain that balance of, yeah. like you said, being a bro and being an asshole. What's, where's the line? Mm-hmm. It's such a difficult balance to keep. So I've learned to, I, I've personally learned to just let it go. Let more stuff go. Let's there was a time let it go. I, I actually do remember now there was a different time where um a uh there was a guy that I knew that was kind of awkward and weird um in a con scene that I was a part of and he he was like whoa man like okay so I don't know what caused him to have to like watch out for my other better friend it was like I had a friend that I was hanging out with and it's like, okay, he was interested in this girl or something. I don't, I don't remember what the events was, but I had good friend was off like making out in a corner with this girl. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. But then like, not so good friend was like, and I'm like, dude, he's just making out with a girl in the corner. Leave him alone. He's like, well, this is like, okay, fine. I got this. Two steps. I was like, fine. Hey, just to shut him up, I was like, hey, good. Yeah, everything's fine. And even me, I was like, what the fuck am I doing? I was just like, hey, everything's cool, right? Uh, you know, you know, look, I, was, I think he was like drinking or whatever, and he wanted to make sure he was making sound decisions or whatever like that. I'm like, okay, sure, whatever. You know, being a little younger or whatnot. And I'm like, I was like, hey, uh, hey, bud, there, you good? He was like, yeah, everything's fine. And I'm like, and then I like, I knew her as well. I'm like, hey, hey, lady. And she's like, hey, Tony. I'm like, hey, uh, so you're good? Yeah, I'm fine. 
you guys will like, say, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm fucking gone. Never going to talk to you again. And I told my not so good friend, I'm like, okay, they're fine. You, guess what? You don't have to do anything the rest of the fucking night because if they disappear, do not follow them. I was just like, you leave them the fuck alone. <laughs> Go enjoy the concert or whatever it was. And I'm like, done. Leave them alone. There is nothing bad that can happen in this exact situation. I know her. She's okay. I know him. He is an all right dude. Leave it alone. And I'm just like, you know, obviously, I guess, I guess now talking about it, I'm actually have been exposed to both sides of the equation. It's like, okay, I knew everything was fine because I knew both of them. I didn't, I, I didn't know the guy so much or in, in the situation where I was, I should have said something. I didn't know the guy so much and I was trying to um, sort of develop a friendship with this guy, but I definitely knew the woman and she was not an okay lady. She is toxic AF. And I'm like, I really should have gone in there and be like, bro, you do not want to mess with this. You needed, you need to step away. And guess what? He should have stepped away, but he didn't. And now next thing I know, he's like, furiously angry by the next time the concert or the next con rolled around and I'm just like well shit yeah I've never <clears> really <throat> had that problem before like not that specific issue but I can see how that would just be really really fucking awkward <laughs> like it's like how that makes you that makes you probably feel kind of bad too because like I should have said something and then, yeah yeah but at the same time it's like you, you more often than not, when it deals with matters of business and feelings and emotions and whatnot, it is always better to be on the safe side. You know, yeah. obviously you want to not be constantly second guessing someone, but at the same time, you, if something looks weird or you feel something is up, you probably should mention something. Follow and you probably, gut. you should follow your gut and be like, Hey, hey just real quick, man. Have, have you thought about this? Have you, have you been concerned at all about this? I just wanted to double check how you feel about it. And if, if something did happen with like, let's say you're a uh, traveling um, convention uh, store, you know, it's like if everything, if, if something ever popped up that you're like, I'm concerned about this, you know, go to the person in charge or follow your chain of command and be like, Hey, have we thought about X? Have we, are we at all concerned about Y or anything here? Like, yeah, no, we thought about it and, you know, we feel that blah, blah, blah. And if you have an open relationship with, I guess, your management and whatnot, they'll be able to, you know, uh, satisfy. They'll be like, no, we have thought about this problem that you've uh, brought up and we have addressed it. And we we view that whatever. Yeah. Thankfully, us being like a small group of like five to, I'll just say five to seven people. If I, if I think of everybody that's involved or can be involved, there's only five to seven of us. So there's really no such thing as the chain of command. He's, we, we have the owner and we're all just there helping out. Mm -hmm. So if, if one of us has a problem and the owner's not there, I'll just talk to, you know, the guy that might be running the stand at that time be like, Hey, did, did, did he say anything about X situation? Or I could just text the owner himself and be like, Hey, what do we do if this happens? Or if he's not there, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But usually Usually the response I get is, we don't have to worry about that. Okay. And so far, it's it's all been true. So far, so far we haven't had to worry about that. So, you know, anything, exactly. anything that I've got that response for, we, we haven't had to worry about. And I guess in most situations, as long as you have some sort of a paper trail or uh, verified interaction or whatever, be like, okay, if you texted the owner, be like, hey, uh, is this something I have to worry about? No, you don't have to worry about that okay, I will not worry about it. And then at that point, it's like, oh, something did happen because of this thing? Oh, well, I tried to bring it up. And now you're ver you're not vilified, but verified in your act and be like, hey, I brought it up. I thought this was going to be a problem. But y'all said, no, it's not something to worry about. And guess what? Now we have to worry about it. Oh, it's the ultimate I told you so. Yeah. But obviously being like, hey, this was something that I brought up five minutes ago. But Dave over here, I don't know if there's an actual Dave or whatever in your no. group. Let's just say there is. I don't know who uh, you're talking about. But but Dave over here, he said it wasn't a big deal. Well, obviously not being indignant like that, but you catch my point. Yeah, just just, uh, just say what happened. Just say, hey, well, I was told by whatever that we didn't have to worry about it. But apparently we did. Oh, well. Whatever the situation is, not, is, you just fix it. That was a failure on leadership, uh, not 
properly delegating what needs to be worried about at that time. Yeah, definitely. Thankfully, everything. Thankfully, everything's pretty straightforward though with us. We don't really have to worry about uh, much of anything. We just get there, make sure we have a hotel, which we always have a hotel. We always make sure that we have a place to stay. That's priority. That's number one. Because you know, if nothing else, I would rather sit. I would rather sit in the hotel room for three to five days doing nothing mm-hmm. versus being on the street for three to five days or sleeping in the fucking van for three to five days. Oh, you don't want to sleep in the cargo van for no, three to five days? No, I do not. Aww, <laughs> I do what's your not. Of adventure? Oh, I, w- I would hate. I I hate sleeping in in vehicles that are not uh, outfitted with beds. I love motorhomes. And I love, like, motorhomes, tour buses, you name it, I can sleep on those, because they're built for it, but I cannot, <laughs> I cannot sleep in, in vans or cars. Just, I can't do it. It sucks. Right. I mean, that's kind of funny, because actually, like, uh, my work, we've, uh, we've adapted a policy where we no longer have schedules, like, hey, you have to be here at 8 or whatever, and we just, are like, okay, you need to at least work X amount of hours a week in order to stay employed or whatever. And, uh, what, what that has led to is me trying to come in super early in the day and try to like get enough hours early in the week, or, um, in some cases train someone at an earlier time frame than what I'm used to. Sometimes I get in at eight when I'm used to getting in at noon and working till eight. Uh, but sometimes it's like, okay, if the person I'm training doesn't show up and since it's still cool outside, I'll just be like. Well, they're not here, so I'm I'm just gonna go uh, take a nap, okay, guys? <laughs> or I don't even actually tell anybody. I just I grab my big poofy down coat, I go in the back seat of my car, and I just like pass out for an hour. Hey, it works. <laughs> so I'm just like, you're like, oh, I hate uh, sleeping in cars, and I'm like, actually, lately I've been sleeping in my car <laughs> a lot lately. Well, I mean, sleeping in your own car by yourself is one thing, but I I would not. I don't think I could. Very comfortably, if I had to, I would. You know, you do what you have to. But I don't think I could comfortably sleep in a cargo van with like five very, very large men because the owner's like six four. His friend that was in New York with us was like is like six four or six three. Uh, the other guy that was there that drove us was like he's like six three or six five or something. They're all between like six two and six five, and my yeah. five foot ten ass is getting fucking squished by, by these like fucking linebackers over here. And they're not just tall. They're bulky. They're like, they're not like insanely muscular, but they're just, they're bulky. Them thick boys. Needless to say, I feel perfectly safe. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Like needless to say, I feel perfectly safe around them. It's just, it's just, I I don't think I could sleep in a, in a cargo van with, with them. It'd just be very, very crowded. Nice. Oh well. Yeah. And, and you're you're what six three? I'm roughly six two, six three. Depends on what gas station I'm walking out of. <laughs> yeah. So so if you if if we ever bring you to a con to help out and and you have to sleep in the van, that just adds to the pile of of man meat. The meat. The meat. Oh my god. One time I had uh, I had a flight going to one of these cons that I went to, and I swear to God, there was a thousand pounds of man in the row I was sitting. <laughs> it was me when I was like my biggest at like 280. There was another like big jacked guy that was like bigger than me. And then another big jacked guy in our row. And I'm like, I'm sitting there looking at like the three of us. And I'm like, there's no way that like, these two guys that also were in the row were were less than three hundred pounds. Like I was the smallest one in the in the row, and you've <laughs> seen me. So I'm like this. I am the window seat in a thousand pounds. I'm like, bro, this this plane is going to start leaning the wrong way. If this was a boat, <laughs> we're all going over because this side is too heavy. I was going to say, I mean, the plane, what's that plane's weight limit, man? Do they have to empty the cargo hold? It's like, uh, if anybody wants to be on the next flight out, we currently have too much beef on this plane. <laughs> Thank God there was actually an open spot. It was like, okay, doors closed, everybody is in. Okay, where can we put the middle seat 
to go find someplace else where he doesn't have to be squished in this. I was like, bro, you need to go someplace else because this is not going to be a happy flight if all three of us have to be stuck here. (laughs) It was just... It was wall to wall. It was so packed. It w- it might have been like, it might have been just a can of spam at that point. It was just wall to wall meat. Jeez, oh, I could I could I could only imagine that that would suck. I'm assuming that's what it would feel like if I had to, if I had to, uh, you know, if I had to sleep in a van with that with, with that amount of people or with the same with similar people. That would suck. Yeah. Oh god, it, flying with that! Oh man, oh man! I've never yeah, I mean, flown like, before. I wonder is it, I've never flown before. It, I, I should. I, I mean, I will at some point. These cons are going to get too far to drive at some point. Am track, my dude. No. <laughs> well, actually, I, we are going to have to drive because well, somebody will because you can't fly. You know, like you can't you can't fly a, a, an entire box truck worth of uh, merchandise. You just can't do it. Guess what you get to do, Kay? Oh, God. Cross you get country. to drive the truck since you don't like to fly. Oh, God. I will say, though, Amtrak <laughs> was quite comfortable. You know, I hear that. You know, it's like, uh, I follow Loading Ready Runs, um, Graham Stark, and his con vlogs and whatnot of what he does. Uh, and he was talking about how he was going from Chicago to New York uh, from one con to another con the next weekend well he had um he was going to leave monday night get in thursday for um the next con and it's like okay well yeah it's the the cost of him having to go back from i think it was from chicago to uh, Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and then back to New York was would have been more expensive than him just taking the three day train or whatever, or taking a late Monday train, early morning Thursday arrival to, or maybe late Wednesday arrival into New York or something like that, Amtrak, and they got a nice like sleeper car and whatnot, and I'm like, oh that. It actually seemed like a nice experience for them. And I'm like, you know, if I'm ever in the point where I have to, like, do back-to-back weekends of cons, you know, maybe I might do that. You know, I might try the whole, like, take a train from wherever to wherever. Yeah. Uh, between. It's just unfortunate that the two cons I might go to this year, um, Babs and Phoenix Comic Con, are definitely not, you know take a train distance and phoenix comic-con is literally in my state so i don't have to worry about you know renting a hotel or whatever i just drive out every morning yeah uh i never took amtrak that much i just took it we took it from new jersey into new york when we were when we were at anime and i see but the short like 15 minute ride was pretty fucking comfortable i hear you know (laughs) it's a very nice (laughs) <laughs> it's a very luxur- luxurious kind of well, not luxurious but just nice thing yeah, did that, I, you know I don't know I don't think I went I don't think I told this story when in the in the video about about the convention I don't know if I I think I told you after we stopped recording stop me if I did no but, go ahead uh, we took the I don't know if this midnight is true. train going anywhere yeah we went we got we took the Amtrak going, going from New Jersey into New York and uh fucking okay. So the boss man and his his friend were a little buzzed. Uh-oh. This was like eight o'clock in the fucking morning or something like that. Woof. They they woke up. This this guy woke up. The first thing he he took the first thing he drank rolled out of bed, shot of uh, like bourbon or something. I'm like, how do you do it? And I'm Don't like, lie. I'm I'm recovering. I'm recovering from a hangover from a bo- from pounding a bottle of wine. Mm-hmm. And, and so we're all kind of just like God save us, and so we're sitting, we're standing there, and they're like swaying next to the track. I'm like, dear God, please don't fall. You are my paycheck and my ride home. But <laughs> so they're like, well, actually, the guy that was driving me home wasn't drunk, but these two were. These two were wasted. And uh, 
so the the train pulls up and it's an Amtrak and we get on the last the last train car we get on the one on the end and we just we're just sitting there and uh, you know they're they're very loud when they're when they're drunk so they're sitting there like loudly cracking jokes and uh, they're like laughing their asses off and like halfway through the I think it was about a little bit before the halfway point of our ride they they just suddenly get quiet. And I'm like, they didn't like fall asleep back there, did they? You know, I'm like, what? Because I'm sitting up ahead of them, and I, you know, they're like quite a few rows back, so I can't mm-hmm. just look back and see where they are. So I'm like, maybe they fall asleep, or maybe they they're on their phones or something. I don't know. So we get to our stop, we get off, and he's like, they're both like, well, one of them's laughing, and the boss man's like, he's he's like pissed off, he's grumbling, he's like, I can't believe that that was fucking ridiculous, and. and and I'm like, what's wrong? And he, he looks at me, he's like, so apparently the last car on the train is what they call the quiet car, where everybody's supposed to be silent in the last car. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, is that true, or did they just tell him that to get him to be quiet? Because <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and he's like all pissed off about it, because I guess he doesn't like being told what to do. So, <laughs> so he's he's like really pissed off. And his friend, I guess, who was also told that this is the quiet car, quote unquote, he's like laughing his his ass off. <laughs> so it was it was really weird. And and they didn't see the booth. This was the first day of the con, mind you. I think yeah, I think it was the first yeah first day of the con. So we started off great. All of us, almost all of us, hung over. Like three out of five of us hung hung the fuck over. Well, no, me hung over. Those two fucking wasted still. So we started off fantastic. <laughs> And uh, they didn't see the booth because they were they were parking the truck, and they were like, "Where do we go?" They're like screaming, "Where the fuck is our booth?" And I'm like standing behind them, like just kind of, I'm literally hurting. I'm literally hurting them. I'm I'm trying to. It's like I felt like a fucking sheepdog because I'm like left, right, take a right here, take a left. I'm like holding my arms out, no, like I'm like here. I'm like tapping their side, like go this way, go that way. <laughs> I just needed like a cane so I could so I could like so I could like nudge them where I needed them to go. Come on now, come on, come <laughs> come on, come on, come on, cut 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 cut. So that's that's literally what I that's literally what I felt like I had to do. So it, it was hilarious. But it was yeah. less funny to me at the time because I had like a pounding headache. <laughs> but fucking time quiet plus car. tragedy. Am I right? Fucking quiet car. I couldn't. I I'll have to Google if that's actually a thing. Or if they just told him that to get him to be quiet. I don't know. I'm thinking they told him that just to get him to shut up. Sir. Sir. This is the quiet car. <laughs> no, it ain't. Yes, it is. Since when? Since five seconds. <laughs> now, now, granted, I, I will say, the car, when we got in, it it was actually completely silent. And when okay. we when we rode the Amtrak, the rest, you know, the rest of the time, we and he, he avoided that like the fucking plague. He avoided it. He was like, "We're not taking that fucking train anymore. We're Ubering from now on." But I think we, I think we took the metro one more, one more time. It, it was Amtrak, and the car that we were in, it was not the last one. It was, it had a lot of people chattering. So maybe it's, maybe it was true. I don't know. I have no idea. I'm, I'm leaning towards that they just told him that to get him to be quiet. Oh, jeez, Louise. <laughs> that's what, that's what I'm leaning towards. I can't believe I didn't say that. I can't believe I didn't tell that story the first time. This. No, it, it's about. new to me. That would have been great on that episode. <laughs> I know, right? Damn it. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I just... I, I love that. That was that was fucking hilarious. The fucking quiet car. Just grumbling about it the entire time. We're, we're taking the Uber from now on. I'm not taking that fucking train anymore. <laughs> like, he was legit pissed. I'm like, all right, man. We'll take the fucking Uber. Just chill. Go to Scallywags. Great bar in New York. Like, go to Scallywags and, and like, ogle at the waitress a little bit more. The bartender. Scallywags, great bar. Try the veal. It, it was a good bar. I never had it. I didn't have any food. I wasn't hungry at the time, but pretty good bar. All right. Well, cool. Cool. I know. Well, tell you what, Kay. I feel like this has been just one dynamite episode. Yeah. Movies, drunkenness, and uh, conventions. Fun, fun tales of everything being said. Um... I'm going to save any uh, episodes uh, or any shows that I've been watching, like TV shows on stream and whatnot, 
till uh, next week when I have a chance to verify whether or not I actually talked about him last week or not. But okay, uh, why don't you go ahead and wrap the episode up there, uh, bud? Yeah, just when I think we don't have enough content to make it to an hour, what do you know, we're over. So, <laughs> I know, right? It's just like, holy shit. All right. So thank, <laughs> so, thank you for everybody for tuning in, for listening, all four of you. I appreciate it. Really do. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're up to 20 views on the first episode. Okay, we're That is great. There. That is really good. Thank you, everybody who listens. Legitimately, thank you. It, it's, it boosts my ego, and I really need that. Thank you very much. And uh, follow us on Twitter at uh, the Maybe Pile Pod. Follow Tony here at Mummified Tony. Me at Kiryoku Writes, so I can insult you. I'm just joking. Uh, I don't insult it's, people. It's at Maybe Pile Pod. At Maybe Pile Pod. There's no the, despite what I keep thinking. And, yeah, uh, and it, but yeah. it is hashtag Ask the Maybe Pile. Getting to that, yes, sir. Hashtag <laughs> Ask the Maybe Pile for any questions that you may have. I'm all giggly now, son of a bitch. So, uh, shit, I was eating my hair. Fuck, what did I do? Yeah, sorry. What are you doing? Well, I was eating my hair. Sorry, I shouldn't do that. Not literally. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, if you have any questions, tweet us, hashtag AskTheMaybePile, and we will answer them on air. I promise. Kind of. And, uh, see you later. Goodbye. Bye!